and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. It's an inarguable fact that Oklahoma is the most ecologically diverse non-coastal state in the country. You've heard us say it many times before, but we literally have everything from antelopes to alligators. And much about what we know of our state's ecological and wildlife diversity was first recorded and documented by two pioneering biologists. Today, we're going to take a look back at the historically significant work of Lester Duck and Jack Fletcher. It's amazing how accurate that map was back then, given the tools they had, the crude tools they had. Uh, most of the roads in the state uh, were not hard service, they were gravel. And the amount of work, the logistics in doing what they did is amazing when you think about what they had to do in the conditions they worked under. Always impresses me when I look at the Duck and Fletcher map and the, the report is the publication date. I think a lot of it was they, they had the time to spend to ground truth and verify those maps. All of this work was done without a lot of modern instruments that we have today for survey work documentation. This was old-fashioned field work, walking and describing what was seen in the field. Even with today's uh, satellite imagery, if you overlay those maps, they were amazingly close with all of the, the unique ecosystems that Oklahoma has. Today, when we are, we're able to drive across the state on really nice roads and we, we've got nice vehicles that are air-conditioned and four-wheel drive, but I think about those guys in the period of time. These guys were coming out of, uh, or had begun developing this map on the heels, or even during one of the country's biggest environmental disasters, uh, the Dust Bowl. And it still uh, holds up today as, as uh, one of the baseline truths from which we look at the uh, changes that have occurred since the 40s. From 1938 to 1942, the Oklahoma Game and Fish Department, known today as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, conducted a comprehensive survey of the state's plants and animals. Led by biologist Lester D. Duck and Jack B. Fletcher, the survey resulted in two landmark products, a map showing 15 unique vegetation types found in the state and a 144-page book titled A Survey of the Game and Fur-Bearing Animals of Oklahoma. Nearly 70 years since their survey, Duck and Fletcher's map and book are regarded by many as the foundation for biological research of Oklahoma's natural resources. The vegetation types and animal communities described by Duck and Fletcher serve as the baseline to which all changes, either man-made or environmental, can be measured since the early 1940s. This is the story of Duck and Fletcher. Recently, Wildlife Department biologist Melinda Hickman met with the daughter of Lester Duck, Joanne Teeter, about the work her father coordinated from their home in Moreland, Oklahoma. Well, actually I was four when it started, and it was through age eight by the time, it was a four-year survey, so it was eight by the time. And I was the only child for six years, so I got to go along with my folks a lot. And so I had a lovely childhood, but that part of it was just almost idyllic. It was wonderful to have all that going on and me being able to observe and see what they were doing. Well, I can remember when all of the, the guys, Jack Fletcher, who was going to do the survey on the east part of the, the state, and um, Lawrence Lefting and my dad and O'Reilly Sandoz, they'd bring pickups in and I remember, the first thing I remember is they had uh, metal cages in the back and one time there were rattlesnakes, you know, and I always got to go out and watch and see what they were doing. And the, one time they brought coyote, a coyote in and then one time they had a uh, porcupine. A porcupine? 
They brought a porcupine in, and the porcupine got out and loose in my grandparents' backyard, and that was really fun because I got to see these guys, you know, chasing down a porcupine, which is a job within itself. But it was just like we were almost part of a family, um, and the, the guys were so cheerful and happy, and they were act like they were so thrilled to be doing this. A primary reason for Duck and Fletcher's survey was due to the recent ecological disaster known as the Dust Bowl. Game and Fish administrators wanted to find out just how much the state's natural resources had suffered from poor farming practices and record-setting drought. At the same time, the passage of the Pittman-Robertson Act placed federal excise taxes on such things as firearms and ammunition, giving state fish and wildlife agencies a welcome new revenue stream to bolster funds generated from hunting and fishing licenses. The new funding source enabled the Game and Fish Department to embark on the comprehensive survey. Often gone for days or even weeks at a time, the surveyors meticulously documented Oklahoma's flora and fauna. Using traps of various sizes and design, the teams inventoried mammals and bird species and the types of habitats whereby each species was found. Traps such as this one, designed to capture white-tailed deer, would not only be used for inventory purposes, but would play an important role in the late 1940s and through the 1960s for the trapping and redistribution of deer throughout the state. The surveyors also trapped bird species. Using long hoop nets, the teams captured both the lesser prairie chicken in far northwest Oklahoma and the panhandle, and the greater prairie chicken found in the Osage country. But even more important than prairie chickens, the surveyors spent extensive hours capturing and documenting quail populations around the state, particularly in the areas hardest hit by the Dust Bowl. Besides bird and animal inventories, the major focus of the survey was categorizing vegetation communities. Duck and Fletcher described 12 individual game types what might be called an ecoregion, biome, or landscape in modern scientific terms, Duck and Fletcher's game types described unique sets of plant communities. Some examples of the game types described include the post oak blackjack forest of central Oklahoma, the tall grass prairie of north central Oklahoma, the oak pine forest of the southeast, or the short grass high plains of the Panhandle. Only one printing of Duck and Fletcher's book, a survey of the game and fur-bearing animals of Oklahoma, was made in the year 1943. One owner of a rare original copy is Jack Fletcher Jr., whose father supervised the survey in the eastern half of the state from their home in Stillwell. He was uh, a very uh, close-mouthed, uh, individual and, and never did uh, brag about anything, any of his accomplishments, but whenever I heard him talk about or mention or work uh, with the wildlife department, that was one of his great loves in life and, and uh, I think that he would have enjoyed that as a, a career full time and uh, heard about uh, all the comments and the talk that he and mom had about uh, the events surrounding that and uh, his close relationship with Mr. Duck and uh, all of the great times that they had putting that, that uh, book together. This book is called A Survey of the Game and Fur-Bearing Animals of Oklahoma. It was produced by the Department of Wildlife Conservation under a Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Grant but everybody knows it and has known it for decades by its authors, Duck and Fletcher. This is Duck and Fletcher to anyone who is familiar with this book. I was first introduced to this book as a graduate student at Oklahoma State. Dr. Brian Glass gave me a copy of, of this book. Uh, he was a, a great professor, recently passed on, and uh, I was proud to have known him. He thought it was important for me to look at this as I was preparing my work on the distribution of red foxes in Oklahoma. This was a great baseline of information for the different types of uh, vegetation where I might look for foxes. This was 
old-fashioned field work, walking and describing what was seen in the field. They used a lot of game rangers at the time, a lot of uh, folks that were working for the department to try to help them describe the habitat and the species composition of the day. So it was, uh, it was just old-time descriptive science and it still uh, holds up today as, as uh, one of the baseline truths from which we look at uh, changes that have occurred since the 40s. I, I have a copy of the original book that I guard very closely. I let students, a few students look at it. <laughs> we, uh, that book is very interesting because the descriptions of the vegetation types are very accurate. And the uh, information about the, the game animals that were there and kind of where they found them on those areas. And I don't know how they did that, but it's a, it's a very interesting historical document. I do have a copy of the book and get it out every once in a while and, and uh, look at it and uh, look at uh, some of the facts that surround the area where we live and uh, the areas that we deer hunt and all. But uh, uh, like I said, Dad never did really talk a lot about the uh, fact that he co-authored that book. Although Duck and Fletcher's book continues to be cited as a reference in ongoing biological research, it is not nearly as well known as their colorful vegetation map. On their landmark map, Duck and Fletcher identified the same 12 game types listed in their book, plus an additional three vegetation types. The Cypress Bottoms, located in far southeast Oklahoma, the pockets of mesquite grasslands in western and southwestern Oklahoma, and the distribution of pinyon pine at the tip of the panhandle. How each of the 15 game types was painstakingly plotted onto the larger state map is perhaps the most remarkable accomplishment of the Duck and Fletcher survey. Using tools and techniques considered long obsolete by today's standards, the map is remarkably accurate when compared with those using the latest and most advanced satellite imagery, global positioning systems, and computer-aided mapping programs. Using a collection of crude county plat maps, countless vegetation clippings, dozens of field notebooks filled with scribbled descriptions and compass coordinates, and natural landmarks such as rivers, streams, and a few mountains, the Duck and Fletcher game type map of Oklahoma is not only the first of its kind, but many still consider it the best and most accurate for showing the potential natural vegetation cover of Oklahoma. Not bad for a document approaching its 70th birthday. I had been out of Oklahoma about 10 years and uh, came back into the state in the early 1990s. And I'd been given a book and a map early, but I was also interested in making sure that my children as well as my nieces and nephews had a map. And so I called the what I thought was the Oklahoma Game and Fish Department, which had now changed its name, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. I called them and they didn't have extra maps, of course. Mm -hmm. And they referred me to the Oklahoma Biological Survey. Yes, it was Bruce Hoagland and he's the one that told me that the map was still viable, it was still being used in the schools and it wasn't due to budget constraints at all. They done several surveys, but this one was the most comprehensive and they continued to use it because it was so pertinent. I've been familiar with the work of Duck and Fletcher for several years and have been interested in trying to learn more about them and, and just how they went about their research and, and compiling their map and report. So it was very exciting one day when I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Duck's daughter on, on the phone. Um, she had called the former director of the biological survey and uh, he put her through to me. Uh, it was a very pleasant conversation, really remember it fondly. Uh, she was describing in particular to me uh, the, uh, the room at their home where her father was doing most of the, the mapping and other research and just listening to her describe it, I can imagine a child, you know, nervously peering in the door to see just what dad was doing back there. I did tell her that, you know, the, the map was, was still in use and a lot of people were, uh, you know, envious or covetous of actually having their own copy of the map or the report. 
um, and that it had played a, an important role or held a, a place of significance in Oklahoma conservation. And, and she seemed a little surprised to learn that, you know, her her dad's work had endured over all of those decades. And of course, my uh, my statement to her was, well, you know, it's a testament to how hard they worked uh, and the uh, detail they put into that map that, you know, it still is considered a, an important resource when, uh, when looking at land cover in the state of Oklahoma. I've just been amazed to find out that I, probably I was one of the last few to really realize the importance of this to the state. Being gone for that 10 years and you have kids and you get busy doing that and you don't pay attention to things as much. And so as far as I can tell and looking back in letters and things, he has tons of letters from people thanking him for this. And also in later years, um, people have contacted my brother who's with the Army Corps of Army Engineers about how much the book meant to them and um, so I I think that what he and Jack Fletcher and all these young men did was just you know amazing to me as well as everybody in my family and I'm sure their families. I don't recall exactly the first time I saw a Duck and Fletcher map but I've always liked maps and I was attracted to it immediately. But like many people that live in Oklahoma, I didn't realize the diversity of habitat types until I saw that map and it was amazing. And so uh, over the years, I've used that Duck and Fletcher map and also the accounts in the book in, in numerous presentations and publications because in order to understand wildlife management and wildlife habitat, you have to understand vegetation types, which the Duck and Fletcher map shows very nicely, very simply, and uh, it gives people an idea of all the different vegetation types we have, and then from that, that's how you make your decisions on how you manage habitat. Interestingly enough, all the greatest mapping technology and all the things we have today, and I've got many sources of maps from a lot of places, but I still like Duck and Fletcher because it, it looks at, at what's there historically and brings it up to date. It's still a very accurate map. It's probably been the cornerstone work for um, a lot of, of wildlife management practices going way, way back has been based on the work of Duck and Fletcher. Even with today's um, satellite imagery, if you overlay those maps, they were amazingly close with all of the, the unique ecosystems that Oklahoma has. We're one of the most diverse states in the nation. And uh, Mr. Duck and Mr. Fletcher's work was uh, just an absolute amazement uh, at the time. And it continues to be a very useful tool that we use today. Uh, it's a layer on our digital atlas. Um, it's, it's um, I guess, in a word, it's been a, it's been a very helpful wildlife management tool uh, for a long time, and it still is today. The work of Duck, Fletcher and their teams of biologists has withstood the test of time and serves as an inspiration to current wildlife department employees. Their book and their ingenious beautiful map continues to be cited frequently in the bibliography of biological research being conducted within Oklahoma and surrounding states. Thanks to these scientists, many people have learned how biologically diverse Oklahoma is and can truly appreciate its many different landscapes. However, looking at a map or reading about Oklahoma's unique places is no substitute for experiencing, in person, what Lester Duck and Jack Fletcher documented so many years ago. Well, even though cartography or the science of map making has obviously advanced with technology, it amazes me how accurate the famous Duck and Fletcher map still is today. Just goes to show that nothing can completely replace good old fashioned ground truthing. Coming up next, it's a happy ending to a story that you're going to love, as we're on site when an injured bald eagle that was successfully rehabilitated is released back into the wild.
Um, today we did our 33rd successful release of a bald eagle back into the wild. Um, it's been a long, you know, we've been open since 2006, so a long 14, going on 15 years. Um, I did a ceremony here um, for this eagle and for the people that was here. Um, the Iowa tribe and other tribes in the United States and throughout, you know, the Canada's and in you know, Mexico, um, we use eagle feathers for traditional reasons. We believe, my tribe believes that the eagle was the only thing to see the face of the creator. So when that bird flew out of the sun, it dropped feathers to us. And we believe if we use those feathers um, for ceremonies, then um, the God takes those prayers. We use that cedar and that smoke, then God will take those prayers and, and help us out. So when we did this for this eagle here, um, we prayed that he would take off and fly very well, really well. And I prayed for all the ones that were here, the ones from the Eagle Aviary, my family, my little girl, and the ones from Oklahoma Fish and Wildlife uh, Department. Um, so we use these feathers in the ceremony for um, a lot of good things. So. Um, I was given this right by my uncle Victor um, when I was about eight years old and I've slowly learned the craft of it and able to be able to use that cedar and that tobacco and those feathers for that purpose. Um, that's a little bit about what I did. Um, the Awe tribe is uh, one of 39 uh, federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma um, and one of uh, hundreds of throughout the United States that have those same type of values. So. I, mean, I thought it was really cool. I mean, the, the, the fact that, that they can rehabilitate these animals and put them back in the wild uh, is, just, is just tremendous. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank the tribe for all their hard work and the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife for what they do and the support that they have uh, for these beautiful, beautiful, majestic animals. You know, as a game warden, it's awesome to see uh, the birds that we pick up get released. It's, we don't always get to do that, so it's an awesome experience. And then to, to see the ceremony that they, they do to go along with it, um, it, it makes it that much more special. So, pretty awesome. Every year we have a number of calls come in on injured birds or other injured wildlife. This particular call come in to Spencer Grace, who's the K County Warden. The bird was actually in Osage County, so Spencer relayed the call to me. Uh, I went out to the site and the bird was right off uh, highway, highway 60 which runs through Osage County and the bird was surrounded or being chased by a bunch of young cattle steers and there were about 10 cars that were watching this eagle because he was so visible to the highway and so I, I showed up and I went out into the field and uh, caught the bird with a net and at that point, once I knew that it was an eagle, I contacted the, the Iowa tribe and we agreed to meet later that night. And so that was the process and how we come about the eagle. It was from originally from the public uh, calling, trying to get help for the bird, the call coming to the dispenser, coming to me, and then I called the Iowa tribe. Larry called me once he had obtained the bird from Spencer and we met up here at Sooner Lake to, uh, for me to get the individual. It was about 11 o'clock at night and we were able to get him back to our facility for an assessment and future care. Um, so he didn't have anything that was broken, there wasn't any toxins in his system and so essentially it came down to a soft tissue injury and those can take a short amount of time to a long amount of time to heal. Um, but this guy is doing great out in his cage. He's able to fly from end to end, obtain food out of our pond, um, and he was definitely ready to go back to the wild. So we're a unique state that we have both uh, golden and bald eagles here in Oklahoma. Um, we're run by the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, in which eagles are a very, very important uh, part of their culture. And so we invite anybody that wants to come out to learn about eagles, how they play into the tribal uh, culture, how they play into the ecosystem, uh, to come out and visit us at the Gray Snow Eagle House. Well, thanks for watching. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma. Hello, I'm Lance Meek. I'm the Hunter Education Coordinator for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. If you aren't aware, we have an online hunter education course that allows you to complete the course from the comfort of your own home 
at your own pace. This is a great opportunity for people wanting to get out in the field. All you need to do is go to our website, wildlifedepartment.com, look under education programs, and then hunter education. And remember, the outdoors are always open. Thank you.